Okay. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 1. We'll start with these. Um, and you know both passages, I'm sure, but we'll, we'll look at them to start and, and use them together. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, <clears throat> having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which hath purposed in himself, then the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Let's bow our hearts now in a word of prayer. God and Father, again we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking at your word and studying it together this morning. And as we do so, we pray that the things said and done will honor and glorify the name of Christ and be edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, this morning we want to continue what we were talking about last week. Last week we talked uh, a little bit about uh, the topic, let's get personal. And we talked about how um, we, we studied back in uh, on, on the anniversary of 9-11 in September. We looked at uh, you know God's will and, and, and whether God's will was involved with who lived and who died on that day. And we looked at some of the specific incidents that happened and, and some of the quote unquote odd circumstances where someone that that you would think should have been there and died but for whatever circumstances wasn't and on the other hand people who really shouldn't have been there uh, but were and, and died that day and how you know, the world says, well, it's luck or fate, and um, you know, Christians want to put a God spin on that and say, no, 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 it's all, it's all a part of God's eternal plan. You know, if you live or you die or where you are or who you are or what happens, or it's all part of God's eternal plan. I knew a preacher once growing up that I listened to a lot said, there is no such thing as luck. Everything is part of God's plan. Well, um, we talked about that a couple weeks ago and saw that that's not really the case. That there is, if you want to call it luck, if you want to call it fate, I, the Bible calls it, what does the Bible call it? You all know. Chance. Time and chance. So you want to call it luck, fate, whatever you want to call it, the, the King James Bible says time and chance happens to them all. So if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, there's a good chance you're going to die. That's just, that's just the way it is, right? On the other end, if you're in the right place at the right time, then good things are going to happen. So time and chance happens to them all. Um, and then last week we sort of expanded on that into the, the, the thought that where a lot of that, that bad thinking about that sort of thing comes from is, is the idea of God dealing with me personally as an individual. Um, we even use the term a personal relationship with God. Um, and, and so we need to understand how God views mankind, how he deals with us. And last week we, we, we talked about that a lot. If you go back to Romans chapter 5, Romans 5 was one of the key passages last week in helping us to, to, to break this down. But God's dealings with us are not are not so much about with us as an individual as they are in looking at mankind in, in groups. Now, we, we be careful with this because politicians today want to, uh, our country is founded basically on individual liberty, that each individual has liberty and freedom and the right to choose and all that sort of thing. And, and that's all, those are all scriptural principles. Today politics is trying to segment us, you know, into groups by race or by economic status or by sexual orientation or whatever. Um, and so, so rather than, than viewing us as individuals, politicians begin to view, view us as groups. So the problem with that is that none of those groups are groups that God recognizes. Um, God, God doesn't recognize race. It's interesting. There's not a word about race in the scripture. Not, not a word. Not one word about it. Um, there, there, you know, as far as sexual orientation, there is word about what is sin and what is not sin in that, in that realm. So, um, so God doesn't break people down in that way. But what he does do is he says, for instance, in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, As by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Here's God's breakdown. There are those that are in Adam the disobedient one, and there are those that are in Christ, the obedient one. Other than that, God really doesn't care. He doesn't care what color you are. He doesn't care what your economic status is. He doesn't care what your ancestry is. He doesn't care what country you live in. He doesn't care any of that stuff. Are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Now, theologians call those two people the federal heads of the human race. Now, federal head 
It's it's just a it's a fancy way of uh, a federal head is is one that stands at the head of something that represents many others. So Adam is the federal head of the human race. He represents all of us, and his uh, his disobedience is attributed and and uh, reckoned to all of us. Jesus Christ is the federal head of all those that come to God by faith, all those that are in Christ, and his obedience is imputed to and and uh, and reckoned to all those that come to God by faith. So those two federal heads, Adam and Christ, they, they represent everyone on planet earth. There's no one on planet earth that can't be represented by one of those two people. And you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. And God view, views us and deals with us in that way. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not so much Dell as who, which federal head represents Dell. When God looks at Dell, does he see Adam or does he see Christ? And we just sang the song very appropriately. Rhonda finally picked the right one, good one. So um, we, we just sang a song about, about in the, God sees my Savior and then he sees me, but where? In the beloved, except he, he's, not, he's not seeing you, he's seeing you in Christ. Or he's seeing you in Adam. So it's all about that headship. And as we said last week, you know, people will, will object to that way of, of understanding and say, well, it's not fair for God to impute Adam's disobedience to me. Okay, but then you also have to say, well, then it's not fair for God to impute Christ's obedience to me either, which means you have to stand on your own before God uh, and either stand or fall based upon your own sin. Is that, is that going to work out well for you? Yeah. It's not going to work out well for you. It's not going to work out well for any of us if we have to stand or fall before God based on our own actions. So God has, has determined to view mankind based on the headship of Adam makes us all in Adam, up in the first part of this passage, verse 12, wherefore as by one man sinned into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So in Adam all sin and all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So if you're in Christ, all those in Christ shall be made alive in him. And God views the human race in that way. So when we're talking about God's will, that's the context in which we need to look at God's will. God's will is based on what his will is for those in Adam and what his will is for those in Christ. And whether you're in Christ, we're not going to take a great deal of time to talk about this today. I think most of you have an understanding of it. You can be in Christ, his earthly people, by being a part of the nation Israel. This is what we've been talking about on Wednesday nights. Or you can be in Christ by being a part of his heavenly people, the church, the body of Christ. Either way, you're identified with Christ. You know, he says to his earthly apostles, earthly disciples, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And Paul says to the church, the body of Christ, he's the head of the church, which is his body. So either way, you have an identification with Christ, whether it's through Israel uh, and that that's physical lineage, or whether it's through the church, the body of Christ and that spiritual lineage. Gospel of the circumcision, gospel of the uncircumcision, gospel of the kingdom, gospel of the grace of God. So, so and, and if, you know, you can go online and watch the Wednesday night stuff to learn more about that. So, how, do, how does his will play into that? Well, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, first of all, let's deal with those that are in Adam. And, and this one, this, you know, who, the people that are in Adam is... Uh, uh, we have to be careful the way we think about this and talk about it because here's God's will. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. So first and foremost, what is God's will for those that are in Adam? Salvation. To be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is, that is clearly God's stated will for all those that are in Adam. But what if they don't, and, and here's a good, this is a good indication that the idea that everything that happens is God's will. Is, so, if God's will is that all men be saved, will all men be saved? No. They won't. Um, go back to Mark chapter 9, for example. And we'll, we'll look at a couple other passages here. Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, it is revealed to us what the ultimate end of those that are not saved. Mark chapter 9 and verse... 
Uh, verse 43, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that sh never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Um, down at the end of verse 45, uh, the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The end of verse 47, uh, cast into hell, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So, so clearly, all people are not saved, so God's will is not always done. What is God's will concerning sin? Everlasting destruction. Everlasting destruction. God, because of his justice, he must punish sin. God will in my no means clear the guilty, we read in the book of Exodus. So, if you fail to be saved, if you deny God's will and don't heed his will, then, then what happens? Everlasting, Everlasting destruction. And that phrase that Keith, Keith is using, if you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and, and you, know, so you say, well, it's, it's, it's not God's, but it is God's purpose to punish sin. It is God's purpose to have a universe that is cleansed of sin. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, To you are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And if you go to Revelation chapter 21, of course, this is the final, the ultimate um, judgment in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and unbelieving, and that word unbelieving is important, that's the real issue. The unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So God must punish sin, even though his will is that all men be saved, his will is also that sin be punished and his universe be cleansed and put back the way it was. So because of that, those that do not heed his will and get saved end up facing the wrath of God. Um, and so he's, it, judgment comes. His, his will for all that are in Adam is that they would be in Christ. But those that remain in Adam and die in Adam, they must face that punishment for sin. Because God is a just God. Um, you know, there's two attributes, grace, and so his will is all men be saved, his grace. But those that will not be saved, refuse to be saved, then they must face his judgment, his truth. So grace and truth are always there in God. And so, he, but, but he's not, it's not that he wants John and Sally and Sam and, and Mary to go to hell. It's that those in Adam go to hell. Those in Adam are judged because sin has to be judged. And in Adam, they are judged. So it, it's, it's not about, you know, this is, this is kind of like the Godfather, you know, when they, when they uh, Michael kills all the heads of the five families. And they, what do they always say when they kill somebody? It's not personal. It's business. It's, business. <laughs> it's not personal, it's business. And, you know, not to equate God to the Godfather, but for God, it's not personal. It's not about you going to hell. It's not about you, you know, he, it's not about your sin. It's about being in Adam. And in Adam, all die. And so, if you stay in Adam and you die physically, you're also going to face the second death, which is the lake of fire. Because you're in Adam. Not because of you, not because of what you did, not because you sinned, but because Adam sinned. You say, well, that, that, that doesn't sound very fair. Okay, you can say that, but we're going to talk now about what do those people in Christ get. And you know what? Those people in Christ, it's not fair for God to take his son's righteousness and reckon it to you either. That's not fair. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't say, well, you know, you're a dirty, rotten scoundrel, but I'll, I'll take uh, Joe's righteousness here and count it to your... That, that's, would we think that's fair? No, that's not fair. But it's the way God views his creation, either in Adam or in Christ. And if you say, well, it's not fair for him to view me in Adam, 
then you have to say, well, it's not fair for him to view me in Christ. And then you're going to stand on your own before God. And if you stand on your own before God, guess where you're still going to end up? <laughs> you're still going to end up in hell. Because in Adam all die. And, and that sin that was in Adam, all of us, all of us, are going to, are going to it, it, given the opportunity, at some point, we will, you read that list, but the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters. And you really say, well, I'm not any of those things now, but you are unbelieving. That's, that's one right clear to the, the top of the list, unbelieving. As you get to that last one, and all liars. So, so has anyone in this room ever not told, a, never in your life, it's like, like 59 years and 11 months and 25 days, Never told a lie. See that kind of that's kind of a catch-all thing, isn't it? That kind of catches us all up in that one. And so does unbelieving. If you're if you haven't believed the gospel, then by definition you're unbelieving. So you can say, well, I'm not a murderer and a whoremonger and a sorcerer and I doll. I'm not all those things, but you're a lying unbeliever. Period. And so you're, you're, you are, are destined for that lake of fire. In Adam or out of Adam, but God chooses to do it in Adam so that he can do some things for those in Adam by placing them in Christ. So, let's talk about the, the good news about God's will now. So that's, that's God's will. That's, that's the ultimate end of those that are in Adam that don't heed God's will and get saved. What about his people that are in Christ, either as a part of the nation Israel or as a part of the church, the body of Christ. Well, let's go to Romans chapter 2. Paul says, talks in Romans chapter 2 about Israel and about their, uh, their, their relationship with God and their relationship with the law. Romans chapter 2 and verse 16. And the day when God shall judge the secrets of men uh, by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent. What is the next phrase there? Being instructed out of the law. How did they know God's will? The law. The law. They were instructed out of the law. So, was there a different law? So, here's the question. Was there a different law for every Jew? No, no. no there wasn't. In fact, how many laws of Moses were there? 613 laws. And, and, and how much of Israel did they apply to? All. All of Israel. So, if you're a Jew, and you rest us in the law, and you make your boast of God, and you, are in, and you know his will, and you're able to approve things that are more excellent, it's because you're instructed out of the law. And the law was extraordinarily detailed. Go back to Exodus chapter 21. Here's a, you know, we, we read Exodus 20 all the time, because Exodus 20 is the Big Ten, you know, the Ten Commandments, and certainly... The Ten Commandments are, are the basis of much of the law. But the law was very detailed. This is what I always like to look at for the detail of the law. Um, Exodus chapter 21 verse 33. If a man shall open a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit, and not cover it, and an ox or an ass fall therein, the owner of the pit shall make it good, and give money unto the owner of them, and the dead beast shall be his. And if one man's ox hurt another's, that he die, then shall they sell the ox, sell the live ox, and divide the money of it, and the dead ox also they shall divide. Or if it be known that the ox hath used to push in time past, and his owner hath not kept him in, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead ox shall be his own. If a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep if a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die there shall no blood be shed for him this is this is detailed stuff wow. you know if you <laughs> if you steal one ox you got to pay back five oxes but if you steal a sheep you only have to pay back four sheep <laughs> what the heck why i don't makes sense it, it makes sense there you go nate it makes sense yeah yeah i Apparently to God it does. So, so was there any doubt? I mean, and, and you know, that's right. Steal a sheep instead. Uh, 
steal something you don't have to pay back. I'd steal. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. You know what Leviticus 11 is. If you don't, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the dietary laws. Leviticus 11 verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are all the beasts which ye shall eat among all beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat, that, uh, that chew the cud, or them that divide the hoof as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean. And he goes through... He goes through the beasts of the field, he goes through the fishes of the sea, and he goes through the fowls of the air. That's God's classification, zoological classifications. Beasts of the field, fish of the sea, fowls of the air. He goes through every one of those categories and says, here's what you can eat, and here's what you can't eat. You know, and some of the things he says you can't eat, you wonder, why in the world, like vultures. Vultures is one of the birds you can't eat. Who in the world would, you know, hey, instead of, instead of turkey this year, I think we have vulture for Thanksgiving. Really? Vulture. Okay. Those things that sit out along the road and eat all the dead stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm really hungry for vulture. So I don't know who would eat that. Rats. You're not supposed to eat rats. You know, all this stuff. The point is, it's very detailed. The fish, the fish of the sea, the stuff that you're not allowed to eat from the sea is the stuff I can't eat anyhow, like the, the, shell, the, the shellfish and the, the stuff. If it's in the sea, if it doesn't have fins, you can't eat it. So clams and eels and you know, all this stuff that doesn't have fins, you can't eat it. You can eat stuff that has fins and swims. Salmon, that's good for you. All, right, all that stuff's good. So the point is, did any, did any Jewish wife have to sit at home thinking, I wonder what God wants me to make for supper. Mm. God, please show me your will. God, please, just show me exactly on this date, before the foundation of the world, what did you determine that I should make for supper? If she did that, what would God say? <laughs> Leviticus 11. Go read Leviticus 11. And, and whatever Leviticus 11 says is clean, you're good to go. And whatever Leviticus 11 says is not clean, don't eat it. In fact, you're not even supposed to touch the carcass of it. You're not supposed to have anything to do with it. So, so God's will about what to eat was clear. God's will about what to do with a, uh, an ox that fell in a hole is clear. God's will about what you do if you steal an ox or steal a sheep. Or, it's all very clear. But his will was the same for everyone in Israel. It wasn't different for Benjamin and, and Zebulun and Daniel and Hezekiah and Moses. It, it wasn't different for each of them. It was the same. Because how did God view Israel? He viewed them in Christ as a part of his nation. That's it. You're a part of my nation. You're in Christ through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I deal with you that way. And I view you that way. And I have a will for you that way. And so you don't have to be wondering. Even you know, the food thing, even if you go back, we've used the illustration before. If you go all the way back to Adam... And that first night that Eve is created and she's in the garden and, you know, I guess the sexist way to say it is that Eve was going to make supper for Adam on the first night. Now the, the, night, the, the, the more enlightened way to say it is Adam was going to make supper for Eve to welcome her on that first night. So whichever way you want to look at it, if Adam or Eve prays to God and says, Oh God, this is the first night together, first night of the rest of our lives this is it, only woman in the world for me, all that stuff. What do you want me to make for supper? I want this to be the perfect night. I want to be right in the center of your will. I want to hit that dot in the center of the circle. What would you like me to make for supper? What would God say? <laughs> of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, neither shall ye touch... Well, that's not it, right? That's what Eve said. Thou shalt not eat of it. Now in the law later, they're not allowed to touch it, but Eve was just told, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day you eat thereof, thou shalt, what? Surely die. It's good that Keith caught that. That's good. He was, he's listening. That's because he's got those big things on back there. He can hear better. So, so you, don't, you don't eat. So he says, well, I'm going to make peach. I'm going to use some peaches. And, and I've decided peaches 
because that's one of the trees we can eat. So I'm going to make peaches. And she goes, and then they go to God and say, well, we could have peach pie. We could have peach cobbler. We could make some peach marmalade. We could, and what's God going to say? <laughs> of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. And as long as you are within God's stated will, he doesn't care what you do. You know, and that's, that, see that gets back to this thing of, but, but I have a personal relationship with him. Mm -mm. You, have, you have a personal relationship with that group. You are in Christ. And God has a will for those that are in Christ. And that's his will. And that's his will for you. And it's not different for you. It's not different for Dell than it is for Galen, than it is for Helen, than it, than it is for Bob. It's not. No. It's the same will. And in Israel, it's the law. The law that God gave to Moses. If you turn to Romans chapter 12, there's lots of places you can go in, in uh, Paul's epistles. But Romans 12 is, is a good one. Uh, and... Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy unto God, uh, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how do you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Well, you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But then Paul goes on to tell you what that is. Look down in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. Condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as I within you, live peaceably with all men. Dear the beloved, avenge not yourselves. Give place to wrath. It's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Have you done all that? Every day? In every way? And, and preacher told me years ago, he said, you know, people come, are going to come to you all the time and say, I need, I need you to help me find God's will for my life. I need, you, I, I need you to help me know exactly what it is God wants me to do. He said, what I do is I sit down with them and we open the Bible and we turn to Romans chapter 12. And I ask them to start reading at verse 9 and read down through the end of the chapter. And, and they read down through that, and, and I say, now, do you have all that? And they say, yeah, I, I got it. And they say, okay, you go away. After you've done all that, then you come back and we'll look at something else. And you know what he said? Nobody's ever come back. <laughs> because you don't do all that, do you? But we know what God's will is. I mean, we know. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Recompense no man for evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Okay. And as long as you're doing that, you know what? God really doesn't care if you're digging a ditch, or designing a rocket ship, or cleaning windows, or manage an airport, or working at the post office. He doesn't care about any of that stuff. Hmm? Tea parties. Or doing tea parties. Well, he's a little shaky on that. But, or doing tea parties. He doesn't care. As long as while you're doing those things, you're doing these things. Because this is his will. All that other stuff is just what you have to do to get along in this world. This sin-cursed world. His will is this. His will is Romans chapter 12. That's his will. And you can, and you can do, you can do a, a, a thousand things while doing these things. So do what you want to do. Get a job that you like. It'll be a lot easier than going to a job. How many people go to work every day and say, I hate my job. You know what God would say? That, well, then get a different one, dummy. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. How many people... Here's one. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. 
Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So, you know, generally that's, we apply that to marriage. And that's a good application of it. Be not unequally yoked together. So, so what's God's will about who a believer marries? Another believer. Another believer. You should be yoked together with someone in Christ. Other than that, I will tell you that your life will be a lot better if you marry someone you like <laughs> than if you marry someone you hate. You say, well, I hate that woman, but I think God wants me to marry her. <laughs> really? Okay. I'll bet it's not going to work well. So, God says, you you." Find someone in Christ. You know, and I tell you all the time when we talk about this, I, it's, it's so hard to convince Ned Lean that I'm not a gift from God, but it's, you know, but it's... But I'm not, really. You marry who you like. You get what job you like. You live, you live where you want to live. I knew a guy years ago that, that lived in Florida, loved the life in Florida, loved the weather, loved all this stuff, but felt like God wanted him to be in Pennsylvania for a job. And then and, and so he, he moved to Pennsylvania and he was here for the job. And but you know what? He, he and his family, his wife, they were miserable. Well, does God want you to be miserable? Does God does God sit in heaven and say, oh, and I move them to Pennsylvania where it's snow and ice and dark and cold and cloudy and they're just going to hate it. And I'm going to go, ha, 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 ha. No. He, he gives us the right to choose. That's where the individualness comes in. As an individual, I can as long as I stay within God's will for the group that I'm in, which is the church, the body of Christ. And God's will for the church, the body of Christ is pretty clearly defined. And as long as I stay within that, I can do whatever, wherever, whenever, however I want. As long as I stay within His will for the body of Christ. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. This passage kind of puts that into perspective in Galatians 5 because, and people will use this to argue against eternal security. 19, Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these... Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which, excuse me, I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So, what's that passage mean? Well, people will take that passage, they take the first part of it, verse, 20, verse 19 down through verse 21, and they look at that end and say, They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And they say, you see there, if you're doing any of these things, then you're not really saved. Because people that do this stuff, they don't inherit the kingdom of God. And therefore, if you go out and you do any of those things, and then they start, are you doing that? Are you doing that? Are you doing that? What are you doing? I'm going to peek through your way. Are you doing that? Because if you're doing that, you don't inherit the kingdom of God. The problem with that interpretation of that is, what group of people is Paul writing this to? Believers. Believers. Galatians. He's writing to the churches of Galatia, which are part of the group, the body of Christ. So he's writing this to the body of Christ. Specifically the body of Christ in the churches of Galatia. So what, has he, what did he already tell them in chapter 4? Well, in chapter 4 he said, verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, so, so who's the ye in that verse? The Galatians. 
part of the body of Christ. So it's the body of Christ, specifically the, the believers in the churches of Galatia. It, it, ye are sons, ye Galatians, ye members of the body of Christ, are sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou, if you're in, a, 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 in the church of the body of Christ, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then what? An heir of God through Christ. So you, if you are an heir of God through Christ, in Ephesians he says that means you are a joint heir with Christ, because you're an heir of God through Christ. So you're a joint heir with Christ. Where do you have an inheritance? In Christ. In Christ. And Christ is a part of what? The Godhead. The Godhead. So whose kingdom would that be? The kingdom of God. It, so if you have inheritance in Christ, Christ is a part of the Godhead, you have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. He already told you that in chapter 4. Then in chapter 5 he says, here's all these things, adultery, fornication, on through the list. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Are you going to inherit the kingdom of God? Yes. Yeah. Well then, should you be doing the stuff that people that don't inherit the kingdom of God do? No. So what about the people that inherit the kingdom of God, that are in Christ? Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's, you are an heir of God through who? Christ. Christ. They that are Christ, you are Christ, because he just told you in chapter 4 you're Christ's. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, then let us also walk in the Spirit. See, the admonition there is you've been made, you've been, through, by being a joint heir with Christ, you've been made a part of the inheritance of the kingdom of God. And you should live like who your father is and who's your father now. It's no longer the devil. It's no longer Adam. It's now Christ and his father. It's like if the queen, if the queen of England, you know, and you look at the royal family, and you know, it, it ain't what it used to be, right? It's, it's just ever since that Markle woman, it's just crazy. So, so, so it's all crazy. And suppose the, the queen looks at her, fan, her kids and her grand, you know, and, and it's all started with Princess Di and Charles, and that's just falling to pieces. So suppose the queen looks at the, calls the family meeting, calls the family all together, and she says, you people are heirs to the throne. And that's a fact, right? By birth, they're heirs to the throne. That, that's, it doesn't matter what they do or don't do, they are heirs to the throne. And she says, you should quit acting like commoners and act like heirs to the throne. Now, none of that affects, are they heir? They are heirs to the throne. They have the inheritance of the, the, the crown jewels of England. But they're not, they're not acting like that's who they are. And Paul's kind of saying the same thing to us. He's saying, you know what? You are heirs to the throne. You are heirs to the God of heaven and earth. You are joint heirs with his son, Jesus Christ, who is the preeminent being of all creation. Now, you should live like that. You shouldn't live like people that have no inheritance, because people that have no inheritance have no inheritance. They're commoners. You don't want to live like that. You have an inheritance with the saints in life. That's the first thing. Remember in, in, in Acts, what he says, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in him. Paul gets sent out to tell people you can have an inheritance. And if you have an inheritance, if you're part of the family of God, he calls it in Ephesians chapter 2, then you should live like that. And God's will for you is clear. Here's God's will for you. Live in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. How many is doing that every day? Every day. But that's God's will. So can you, can you dig a ditch and live in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance? Yeah. 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 Could you... Be, 
I was going to say, could you be a politician? Probably not. Um, could you, could you, um, could you fly a plane, be a pilot, and live in love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance? Yeah. As long as you're married to another believer, can you can you live in uh, joy, peace, long suffering, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance? Yeah. You can live in those things no matter what you do for a living. No, can you can you live in in love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, living in Pennsylvania? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And if you can't, you know where you shouldn't live? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. <laughs> if if you if you put yourself in your life in a condition or a place or a circumstance or a situation that, that causes it to be very difficult for you to live in these things, then you know what you should do? Get out of that situation. Because God doesn't care where the situation is. He only cares if you do these things. And if the situation you're in is preventing you from living in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, then you need to get out of that situation and get into a different situation where you can fulfill these things, the fruits of the Spirit. Because he doesn't care about all that other stuff. All that other stuff is just stuff. This is the important stuff. And the stuff in Romans chapter 12, that's the important stuff. Because that's what his will is for all of us. And it's not different for any one of us. It's the same for all of us. Because he views us in Christ as a part of his body. And his apostle Paul gave the instruction and the will about the body of Christ. Here's what I want the body of Christ to be. And you know what that means? It means you have to grow up and make decisions on your own. <gasps> you mean what I have to decide where I'm going to live or who I'm going to marry or what I'm going to do or what color socks I'm going to wear this morning? I, I, I can't just ask God and say, Oh Lord, please show me your will. Write it in this. Nope. You got to grow up and make a good decision, or you got to ask your wife, one or the other. But you got somebody's got to make that decision, and that decision—that's what it is to be an adult son of God, to make those decisions in the context of living a life of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. In that, you put yourself in the best position and circumstance and situation to be able to live those things. Because those things are what God cares about. He doesn't care what you do for a living. He doesn't care who you're married to as long as it's in Christ. He doesn't care where you live. He doesn't care what kind of car you drive. He doesn't care about any of those things. He cares about love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And as long as you can be doing those things in the circumstances where you are, then he's happy. You are right in the center of his will. Let's bow our hearts on a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that your will is made known to us. And we need but read it, study it, learn it, and do it. And we pray that we would, we would make decisions in our lives that put us in better position and better situation to do, to understand and to do your will. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. In closing, let's all stand. Let's sing He is Lord as we're dismissed. And uh, see you Wednesday night. He is Lord. He is Lord. He, excuse me, excuse me. The dead and He is Lord. 